Welcome to the home of John Greenleaf Whittier, where he lived from 1836 when he was 28 until his death in 1892. The house was designated as a National Historic Landmark in 1962 and listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1966. This video is created and produced in 2020. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, it was impossible to open the home for visitors. Even though we have been shuttered, much has been done to ensure the integrity of the building with major renovations. However, what you will see and hear is equally valid for the subsequent years, and, and we hope you will both watch the video and visit us for real in the future. We are in the old kitchen, one of the four rooms in the house. Living in the 21st century, it's hard to imagine how important poets and poetry were to 19th century Americans. In Amesbury and across the continent, there are bridges, streets, towns, cities, schools, parks, and even a covered bridge and a mountain named for Whittier. The purpose of this tour is to give you a feeling for John Greenleaf Whittier, how he lived and was esteemed in the 56 years he called this his home. This video gives you an overview of the Whittier home, what can be seen and show how important he was as a poet and an abolitionist. It covers most of the topics that arise on the normal physical visiting hours and at each point provides some detail. It does not attempt to cover all of the artifacts and topics included in an actual tour. The move to Amesbury from the homestead farm in Averill, where Whittier was born, was precipitated by the death of his father and his uncle and the marriage of his brother Matthew to a non-Quaker woman, which meant he had to move out of the family home, and that left Whittier as the only man to manage the farm. Whittier had never enjoyed farming, and by 1836 had found his voice and calling as a writer. Three years earlier, he had become involved in the abolitionist cause, to which he had decided he would devote his life until slavery was ended. They sold the farm for $3,000, and with their shares, Whittier and his mother bought this house for $1,200. The choice of Amesbury is determined by four factors. Most importantly, it was the site of the Friends Meeting House, to which the Whittiers had been traveling weekly from Haverhill. It was an urban area, which meant they would not have to keep a horse and carriage. Amesbury had a reputation for being a liberal, tolerant, and classless society. And it was here that Whittier actually found a place for William Lloyd Garrison to give an anti-slavery speech in 1833, when Garrison could not find a place in Newburyport. Finally, Amesbury was beautiful, when Whittier was always very sensitive to natural beauty. There was hardly a spot from which he couldn't see a hill or a pond or a lake or a river. When Whittier moved to this house with his mother, his sister Elizabeth, and his Aunt Mercy, it looked like the picture on the mantel. The house was only four rooms, and so Whittier put a small addition to, for Aunt Mercy at the back, and Elizabeth slept in an unfinished attic under the eaves. This was less than ideal for a family, but even less than comfortable when they put up visiting Quakers and abolitionists. In 1847, Joseph Sturge, a British Quaker and abolitionist, visited Whittier, and he was absolutely appalled by the tight quarters. He gave Whittier $1,000 to enlarge his accommodation, and he more than doubled the addition for Aunt Mercy, who had died in 1846, to add a garden room and to put a second story on the east side of the house, <clears throat> and a comfortable bedroom for Elizabeth, and a large guest room for visitors. These pictures show the house as it's in its various stages of completion, from the original four rooms in the picture on the mantelpiece to the extensions provided by Joseph Sturge's gift in 1847, and then further extensions after his success with the publication of Snowbound. You will find out more about Snowbound in the next room. 
to the final editions of the house after his death in 1892, when finally modern indoor plumbing was installed for the first time inside water, bathrooms, and toilets. Finally, he had a summer kitchen added, and it was added originally perpendicular to the house on Picard Street. This has made a couple of, moved a couple of times, and it now sits in the backyard, and we use it to serve our teas in the summer, and we hope to resume those in 2021. We are standing in the original kitchen. Many of the artifacts on the hearth and the mantel were brought over from the homestead in Haverhill. The box on the floor was used to put coals in and put in the carriage to keep the feet warm. It was taken to the meeting house, as many churches and meeting houses did not have any kind of heat in them. The stove had coals put in the bottom, and the door was closed, and when women decided or when they wanted to bake, they would put their forearm into the oven, and if it singed the hairs on their forearm, they'd know that it was hot enough to bake. The door was made from a very hard wood, and it, I'm sure it was replaced many times. Other artifacts are what they call a peel. Looks like a pizza paddle and it was used for placing items in and out of the oven for baking. Uh, the flat iron down in the center was used, obviously, for ironing. And there's a saying, too many irons in the fire. And how that came about was that in larger homes where they had uh, maybe some servants, there were three, maybe four flat irons heating up all at the same time. And when one would be brought back, by one servant and taken away, um, the next servant would come and say, all right, there's too many irons in the fire. Which one is the hot one? On the mantel is a match safe. And on either side of the picture of Lincoln, there are two candlesticks. And they are called hog scraper candlesticks. I know that's a funny name, but it's the truth. When hogs were slaughtered, candle would be lit, the bristles would be singed off the hog, and they would be scraped off the hog with the bottom of the candlestick for a much more hygienic slaughtering process. Whittier was a great admirer of Lincoln, and it's likely that this picture dates from Whittier's time when this would have still been the dining room. When the Civil War began on April 12, 1861, it was a war to save the Union. It did not become a war to free the slaves until January 1st, 1863. Lincoln told a war correspondent that Whittier's work, Luther's Hymn, had influenced him to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. What Whittier did in that poem was to shift the focus of the war from saving the Union to freeing the slaves. This is an excerpt from this poem. Luther's Hymn. What breaks the oath of the men of the South? What whets the knife for the Union's life? Hark to the answer, slavery. O North and South, its victims both, can you not cry, let slavery die, and Union find in freedom? We're now going over to what is called the Snowbound Room. This was originally two bedrooms. The snowbound room is what we call it now. And it was two rooms. The wall between them has been removed. The front half where I'm standing was Whittier's bedroom. He moved upstairs after Elizabeth died. The back half was his mother's bedroom, which would have been warmer because of the fireplace. On the right side of the door entering this room is a picture of the great elm on Boston Common which came down in a storm in 1876. The mayor of Boston presented Whittier with a piece of the tree from which Whittier made this table below. The 
the pictures of Whittier along the top we think were taken approximately 10 years apart. The pictures along the bottom are of the women in Whittier's life. The profile is of his Aunt Mercy, the photos are of his mother Abigail and his sister Mary and his sister Elizabeth. The picture frame underneath is a lineage chart of Whittier. It's too small to be able to uh, see on the video, but we do have it available in our gift shop as a scroll. The homestead is where Whittier was born, where he lived for 28 years, and where he returned in his memory to write his greatest work, Snowbound, A Winter Idol. It's also the scene of the barefoot boy, and a reproduction of the painting by e Eastman Johnson hangs below the two pictures of the homestead in various um, seasons of the year. Whittier attended a school, like the one in the painting at the bottom, for three months a year until he was 14. The school had one room with pupils of all ages and one teacher for all students. Joshua Coffin, Whittier's teacher, lent him a copy of Robert Burns' poetry when he was 14. Burns made a deep impression on Whittier because he was also a farm boy. The, this most likely set Whittier on his path as a poet. Whittier and Coffin remained friends for many years, and a friend gave Whittier a copy of Robert Burns' manuscript in the poet's own handwriting, which also hangs here. When Whittier was 18, his older sister Mary sent one of his poems to the Newburyport Free Press without his knowledge. William Lloyd Garrison was the editor of the Free Press at the time, and he published the poem, which was signed only W. Haverhill. After three and a half months of receiving and publishing the poems, Garrison decided to find the poet. When he realized that Whittier was only a boy, Garrison urged Whittier's father to see that he got more education. And Whittier did attend two terms at the new Haverhill Academy. The first he paid for by making shoes with a farmhand in the off-season, and the other he paid for by teaching in a one-room school. He found the latter experience so unpleasant that he decided it was not worth continuing his education. However, Whittier taught himself very well through his reading and was able to perform the duties of the editing job that Garrison got him at the National Philanthropist. Whittier continued to earn a living and support his family as the editor of one paper after another until the success of Snowbound made him financially independent. Prior to the publication of Snowbound, Whittier never earned more than $500 a year. Snowbound earned him $10,000 the first year, which is roughly the equivalent of $150,000 today. This picture of the Champions of Freedom shows the importance of Whittier, most likely still in his 30s, as an abolitionist. Whittier is in the middle, surrounded by four leading anti-slavery senators. To my left is a picture of Charles, Senator Charles Sumner, a personal friend of Whittier's, and Sumner was a senator from Massachusetts who was beaten unconscious with a cane on the floor of the Senate by a Southern con congressman because of anti-slavery speech that he gave in the Senate. The beating is often referred to as the first step in the Civil War. It took Sumner four years to recover, but when he returned, he gave a five-hour speech entitled The Barbarism of Slavery which was so complete there was never a need for another anti-slavery speech before the Senate or Congress. We're now going to focus the other end of what was in the two bedrooms. We are now in what was Whittier's mother's bedroom. Theodore Parker, over my right shoulder, was a Unitarian minister who led the movement to combat the stricter Fugitive Slave Act, which was enacted with the Compromise of 1850. And it required that law enforcement and citizens of all states 
free states as well as slave states, assist in the recovery of fugitive slaves. Parker called the law a hateful statute of kidnappers, and he helped to organize open resistance to it in Boston. Parker coined two phrases which are associated with more famous persons who borrowed them. In an 1850 speech, Parker used the phrase, a democracy of all the people, by all the people, for all the people, which later influenced the wording of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. He predicted the inevitable success of the abolitionist cause this way. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. A century later, Martin Luther King, Jr. paraphrased these words in a prepared statement that he read in 1956 following the conclusion of the Montgomery bus boycott. He would later use a similar paraphrasing to great effect in two famous speeches and his final sermon. King's paraphrase included the words, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Wendell Phillips, over my left shoulder, was a Boston lawyer, and he witnessed the attempt of lynching of Garrison and gave up practicing law to work for the abolitionist cause. After being converted to the abolitionists in 1836, Phillips joined the American Anti-Slavery Society, and he frequently made speeches at its meetings. So highly regarded were his oratorical abilities that he was known as abolition's golden trumpet. Like many of his fellow abolitionists who honored the free produce movement, Phillips took pains to avoid cane sugar and wore no clothing made of cotton, since both were produced by the labor of southern slaves. In the corner to my left is a picture of Pennsylvania Hall in Philadelphia. Pennsylvania Hall was built for the abolitionists, and it was emblazoned with the motto, Virtue, Liberty, and Independence. It stood for only three days before it was burned to the ground by anti-Negro rioters on the night of May 17, 1838. Whittier had arrived in Philadelphia earlier in March of 1838 to edit the Pennsylvania Freeman, and he was actually in the hall when it was attacked. Whittier escaped by donning a long black coat and black hat and ran from the front door with everyone else shouting, hang Whittier, hang Whittier, thus disguising his identity. The, the photo below Pennsylvania Hall is of Lucretia Coffin Mott, and she was a Quaker minister opposed to the slave trade and active in the American Anti-Slavery Society. The frame of her picture and the walking stick hanging next to the two pictures were made from wood that was salvaged from Pennsylvania Hall. The desk in this room is the one on which Whittier wrote Snowbound. These are the first few lines of Snowbound. Snowbound, the sun that brief December day rose cheerless over hills of gray and, darkly circled, gave at noon a sadder light than waning moon. Slow tracings down the thickening sky its mute and ominous prophecy, a portent seeming less than threat, it sank from sight before it set, a chill low coat, however stout, of homespun stuff could quite shut out, a hard, dull bitterness of cold that checked a mid-vein the circling race of lifeblood in the sharpened face. The spinning wheel and this chair belonged to Whittier's mother. It was used to spin flax into linen thread. The Whittiers grew flax on the farm, and they made their own cloth and coats.
This is where Whittier loved to spend his time. This room was added in 1847 with the thousand dollars that Joseph Sturge gave to Whittier. It's the most authentic room in the house, with the original wallpaper and the carpet still in place. The, the furniture was purchased after the money from Snowbound started coming in, in 1866. The covers are original, except for these red chairs, which were recovered in the 20th century. This room is the most Whittier. It was his favorite after he was after it was built, and he had a desk from which he could see anyone coming by looking to his left to visit him before he could be seen. He could welcome the visitor for socializing, or he could escape if he didn't want to socialize by opening the door with his hat in his hand, which he kept on his desk at all times, by the way, and saying regretfully that he was just going out. Then he could circle the block until the coast was clear and return to his work through the back door. He had a chaise lounge for a nap and his own stove so that he could keep the temperature as high as he wanted. Whittier was always cold. He was a very tall man. And he had a view of his fruit trees and the back garden. It was here that Whittier kept his favorite pictures. There was Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin in serialized form and sent it chapter by chapter to Whittier for editing and publication in the national era. He was the corresponding editor of that paper at the time. The pictures of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Thomas Starr King, one above the other, uh, were Whittier, two of Whittier's favorites. Emerson was a philosopher, an essayist, a poet, founder of the Transcendentalists, and the Saturday Club, to which Whittier belonged. Emerson would sometimes read Whittier's poems for him when Whittier didn't want to read them himself. Whittier was very shy about reading in public. Another man who read for Whittier was Thomas Starr King. When Whittier met King in New Hampshire, when he vacationed there, King was a self-made man who had to drop out of school and support his family at 15, something that deeply impressed Whittier, as he edu and he had edu educated himself and become famous for his oratory at a church in Charlestown when he was asked to assume the Unitarian ministry in San Francisco. He organized the Pacific branch of the Sanitation Committee, which was the forerunner of the Red Cross during the Civil War. Lincoln credited him with preventing California from becoming a separate republic during the war. Over the desk, is a small picture of Matthew Whittier. Matthew was the younger brother of John Greenleaf. He was married twice and had at least one other woman companion. He also wrote a satirical column for a newspaper, but it didn't do well. Through his friendship with Senator Charles Sumner, Whittier got Matthew a position at the Boston Custom House, which he held for 20 years. The other pictures are people who are important at the time. Garrison is on the right side of the chimney, and across from Garrison is Henry Houghton, Whittier's publisher and founder of the Houghton Mifflin Publishing Company. Now, let's look at the pictures on the other wall on the other side of the room. The most notable pictures here are of Joseph Sturge, to the left of a very fine picture of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who was the most famous poet in the United States at the time. Now let's have a look at the room from the far corner before we move on to the parlor. This was the only living room from 1836 until 1847, when the garden room was built, and then this became the formal parlor for receiving guests. The dates of the furnishing, furnishings in here is not known, except that Whittier's chair was a gift from George Peabody, a local philanthropist, and was built to Whittier's specifications. That would most likely have been in the 1860s, as Peabody died in 1869. The chair was his favorite, and it folded up so that he could take it with him when he went to visit his cousins in Danvers. The room contains portraits of the family. The largest on each wall are of his mother over the mantel, Abigail, his sister Elizabeth on the front wall, 
his brother Matthew to my left, and of Whittier himself, the parrot hanging over my head is a replica of Charlie. Charlie was Whittier's sister Mary's pet, which Whittier took in after she died in 1861. Charlie had a couple of bad habits, though some people found them amusing. He would sit on the roof and he would alternate shouting obscenities that he had heard aboard a ship where he was raised, and then he would shout, whoa, at passing horses, often causing them to stop in their tracks and cause major traffic backups. The hole in the door over my head was put there for Charlie, suggesting that the parlor door was usually kept closed to conserve heat. On the wall to the right of the window is a picture of the Jubilee Singers from Fisk College. This college for freed slaves was only five years old when it was facing serious financial difficulty. To avert bankruptcy and closure, Fisk's treasurer and music director George L. White gathered a nine-member student chorus to go on tour to earn money for the college. They earned $40,000 on the tour and they saved the college. They introduced America to Negro spirituals and provided the first opportunity to see black people perform. Prior to the war, black roles were played by whites with their faces blackened. In 1879, when the Jubilee Singers came to Amesbury to give a concert, they visited Whittier to thank him for his efforts to end slavery. They sang some spirituals for him and they left an autograph album to be picked up the next day. Whittier wrote his first draft of the Jubilee Singers in the album that night. The Jubilee Singers Voice of a people suffering long The pathos of their mournful song The sorrow of their night of wrong Their cry like that which Israel gave A prayer for one to guide and save Like Moses by the Red Sea's wave The stern accord her timbrel lent To Miriam's note of triumph sent Or Egypt's sunken armament the tramp that startled camp and town and shook the walls of slavery down, the spectral march of old John Brown. The storm that swept through battle days, the triumph over long delays, the bondsman giving God the praise, voice of a ransomed race, sing on, till freedom's every right is won and slavery's every wrong undone. On the table near the door, is the death mask. It was a custom at the time to make a mask of famous persons after death, of plaster or wax. The inclusion of the hand is unusual and most likely is a tribute to Whittier's stature as a poet and a writer. Whittier died on September 7, 1892, while on a visit to his Hampton Falls cousins. His body was returned to Amesbury and laid out here in the parlor in front of his mother's picture with flowers that reached to the ceiling. 5,000 people walked by his coffin during his wake. At Whittier's funeral, 1,000 people were packed into the backyard. See the picture behind the death mask. The next day, 2,000 people are said to have visited his grave in the Quaker section of Union Cemetery here in Amesbury. Flags flew at half-staffed and buildings were draped in black. It was a time of mourning for the nation. To finish, we're going to move to the modern part of the building, circa 1905, where we will review John Greenleaf Whittier, and you will get a chance to see our Whittier gift shop. This is both our gift shop and a meeting room for indoor functions and poetry readings. Sometimes we have poetry readings in the snowbound room. Whittier's earliest poetry was about legends and was written in a stilted poetic diction had he continued to write this way, he would have had very little attention, even in his own day. But when he started writing for the abolitionist cause, his language became vernacular, accessible, and passionate. It had the power to persuade and move his readers. After the war, he turned to the subject of his childhood, a time that was lost but revered in the minds of war-weary Americans. He wrote in a common language, 
that Americans could identify with. Although his poems were popular, his earnings from the appearance in places such as Atlantic Monthly and the reissuing of his collections were not enough to make Whittier rich. But then in 1866, Whittier made $10,000 from the one poem, Snowbound, which was published as a short book initially. From that time on, Whittier, who had struggled financially all his life, was not only comfortably well off, but he was in demand for any occasion which called for a poem. For the most part, part he could name his price. An interest in Whittier and his poetry lasted with no perceptible decline for a generation after his death. There were impressive observances, observances in 1907 of the 100th anniversary of his birth, also along with the flood of articles by men of importance in the literary world. At the 20th century, as the 20th century progressed, Whittier's vision seemed too innocent for generations who had lived through a depression and two world wars. But Snowbound will continue to live as an idealized portrait of 19th century New England farm life. His abolition poems remain as testimony to his contribution to ending slavery, and many of his poems are still found in Protestant hymnals today. We hope you have enjoyed this tour, and hope we, it has whetted your appetite to visit us in person. The physical tour includes two upstairs bedrooms and a, a full corridor of pictures. You can find out more at the Whittier Home website at whittierhome.org. We also hope that it has piqued your interest in Whittier and that you seek out his poems and his works, and also to seek out other museums in the area in particular the Whittier birthplace in Haverhill. Other local places of historic interest nearby are known as the Amesbury Treasures, and they can be found at amesburytreasures.org. This is a poem written anonymously by one of Whittier's neighbors. It indicates how much he was esteemed and beloved in the community. The poem is entitled, Ours. Ours. I say it softly to myself. I whisper to the swaying flowers. When he goes by, ring all your bells of perfume, ring, for he is ours. Ours is the resolute, firm step, ours the dark lightning of the eye. The rare, sweet smile and all the joy of ownership when he goes by. I know above our simple spheres his fame has flown, his genius towers. These are for glory and the world, but he himself is only ours. The Whittier Home has a lovely garden, and we will finish with a few pictures from outside the home.